Africa is considered the last frontier for global development in the sense that other, other regions in Asia, for example, uh, and other continents have done much better in terms of structural change and human development. But this same century has also been described as the African century. And this may mean different things to different people. The one clear notion that is captured in that description is that while Africa may well be a continent with the greatest material challenges, it is undoubtedly the continent with the greatest opportunities and potentials. And I think that this stands to reason. Earlier today, I was speaking at an event, and I'm going to uh, call a few and maybe explain a few of what I said at that event. Because again, it dealt with questions of Africa and innovation. Take population, for example. By 2035, Africa, we're told, will have about 1.2, 1 1.3 billion people. Nigeria, its most populous country, will become the fourth most populous nation in the world. Over 50% of that number will be young persons, some say 60, under the age of 25. Today, 60% of unemployment in Africa are young people. And so the implications of social upheaval are clear. Aside from that, climate change also poses special concerns, especially the certification and the drying up of, you know, uh, for example, the Lake Chad and its implication for lives and livelihoods, especially of those who depend on that lake. And many know, of course, that that lake used to be about 35,000 square kilometers. Today, it's under 1,500 square kilometers. And of course, there are huge implications for, uh, the, for, for life around it, for those who farm and those who fish, and all of those whose life was dependent on it. And then the challenges of healthcare delivery and education for a large population have led, in Africa in particular, to some of the worst human development indices in the world. But these challenges, all of these challenges, whether they be of population, whether they be of the human development indices that are so poor, all of these challenges, in my own opinion, have peaked at a very auspicious time. A time such as we are in, a time when technology and innovation have begun to disrupt older and slower ways of achieving results. And for Africa, a time when its young innovators, its digital scientists and creatives have emerged with incredible creativity and resourcefulness. There's no question that the key to our best dreams for Africa of tomorrow is innovation, is technological innovation, innovation and technology. Africa will skip or leapfrog over many phases of development that other continents have had to go through. Let me just take what I mean with some uh, very quick examples. We are familiar, of course, with the success of mobile phones in Africa. And I think we all understand that given this, just given the, uh, the innovation around the mobile phone, there was no other path for Africa to go. We simply leap from, from the fixed lines to mobile phones. No way of repeating what had been done between 1950 and 1980 in all the other nations. So it was a quick for us, a very quick move. But what has that resulted in? On the back of mobile phones, we have seen some of the most uh, some of the most incredible developments, especially in uh, digital financial transactions, payments, electronic wallets, and all of those other all of those other uh, innovative steps that would have required perhaps a whole banking infrastructure. So today, mobile telephony has opened up businesses in rural areas in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and has led to greater financial inclusion and wealth creation. The federal government, for example, in some of our microcredit, some of the microcredit schemes that we've run, we've given so far about 2.4 million microcredit loans to several different categories of Nigerians, especially the bottom of the third. 
and all the data has been on the back of some kind of mobile payment system or the other. And the wealth of some of the very exceptional fintech companies have also been on the back of mobile telephones. But that's just one aspect. How about healthcare? In many other countries of the world, especially in the more developed uh, economies and countries, the desired ratio of patients, they say, is about 1 to 500 or 400. To reach that ratio, we would require 400,000 physicians alone in Nigeria. But the only way we'll be able to deliver quality health care to Nigeria is, is through a system where skilled people are augmented with intelligent innovation and technology, including telemedicine, artificial intelligence, etc. What we're already seeing today groundbreaking innovations all over Africa. Today we have indigenous companies. Rwanda, for example, and even one that started in Nigeria, delivering blood to hospitals in remote locations using drones. But there are even more remarkable innovations. There's a 28-year-old Cameroonian, Alpha Zag, who was featured recently on CNN for inventing a touchscreen heart monitoring tablet called the Cardiopad. And that Cardiopad has the potential, in my view, to revolutionize medicine especially in remote areas. The cardio part provides access to health care for heart patients in remote areas who don't need to take long journeys to the cities where the heart specialists are located. So the tablet itself is equipped with four electrodes that can be attached to the patient's chest to determine whether their heart is functioning normally or not. The data is then wirelessly transmitted to the cardio part and the cardio parts are then sent to the cardiologist who can interpret it and then get the necessary prescriptions. Another Nigerian, uh, this time in Nigerian record, Porsche Adyami, was also featured on the same uh, platform. He created a device that can detect cancer cells and even explosives. The system merges synthetic neurobiology with traditional silicon technology. And this system is quite able to quickly and with, with, with remarkable accuracy determine whether cells in the body are cancerous or not. It can also, as I said, detect explosives. Of course, with growing threats to security globally, this particular information could be revolutionary. The first to fuse like micro neurons from my stem cells into a silicon chip. But for me, perhaps the most remarkable innovation in healthcare is the work that's been done at our innovation hub in Yola in Adamawa State. It's called the Northeast Humanitarian Hub. Just last week, a group of interns designed and printed and assembled a 3D, a 3D printed prosthesis link for an assistant superintendent of police, Mr. Tupa James, who lost his arm while on active duty. Those interns, uh, Bashir Rigao, Suleiman Khabib Adam, and Kabir Rajao, and their colleagues were trained in Yola and worked with a number of volunteers with community techniques. The equipment and materials that were required for the process all in Yola, all the work was done in Yola. And they're able to repeat this, they're able to do this time and time again. Food security. Is again. Food security is also an area of need. Africa, we are told, has 60% of the world's arable land, but we still import over 80% of our food. We can only feed our huge population with food productivity from our tens of millions of farmers in Africa. But this will require access to imports. But also, so accurate information about what to plant, when to plant, how to cultivate. So, geospatial and satellite data and access to mechanization on an as needed basis will be crucial. Also, new ways of increasing productivity will be important. For example, a Nigerian innovator again, Angela Delaga. Again, she was recently featured on BBC, the World House. She runs a farm called Farm at Fresh Direct, Fresh Direct, 
the farm uses starch containers with a focus on supplying premium organic vegetables using hydroponics and vertical farming technology. Angel is solving the problems of traditional farmers using technology and bringing solutions right to people in your steps. So this is modular farming for African cities. But how about private sector funding for agriculture? The technology through crowdfunding options are already taking over. And there is Thrive Agri, for example, this is an innovative agri technology startup, which is supported by a Nigerian early stage venture capital fund called Ventures Platform. Thrive Agri was founded by uh, two, uh, two young men, Okra EJ and Ayo Arika. One of them a farmer, the other a software engineer. The company leverages technology to aggregate finances for small local farmers. They also provide inputs and farm extension services that you know so they're able to improve farm yields and they're able to they've been able to do so fourfold for thousands of ordinary farmers across the country. So there is so already and tribe agreement is just one, there's another called farm gravity. These are new innovative ways of bringing private capital to, uh, to agriculture. Most of the investors, of course, never ever, ever get to see the farms. All they wait for was their dividends. How about power? It's clear that power problems will also be largely solved by the multiples of disruptive innovations that we're seeing today. The days of the traditional model, one national grid fed by large power stations are numbered. The smarter and more scalable options are using renewable energy sources, power, uh, solar, wind, biomass, and waste to power. And the possibilities are limitless. Recently, the Nigeria Climate Innovation Center, uh, and that is located at the Lagos Business School. It's, a joint, it's jointly owned by the federal government, uh, the Lagos Business School. And, and uh, some other, one or two other investors. They recently concluded their climate launch plan and came up with some very innovative ideas. One of them is a company called New Digits that has developed a process of generating power from water. The product uses water and conformed solar cells to generate energy for electricity and cooling. It works by collecting water automatically from any piping channel in the house. It breaks down the water into hydrogen, which is used then to cook and to power the entire house without the need for batteries of any kind. Another company called Power School Energy, founded by three uh, young uh, uh, three young Nigerians, okay, Abdul Aziz and Glory. They produce a low-cost clean smokeless food store. Power School Energy is the first clean Bookstore to be fitted with self powered uh, Internet of Things cloud system to monitor in real time a single day of cooking the amount of, 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 of CO2 and biomass that is saved, the black carbon that is prevented, and the total electricity that is generated. All of this can be aggregated in one day. Secondly, Africa is leading the way in in a number of different innovations, different ways of thinking, as innovators figure, especially in this past year, how to produce power in the city, new storage technologies, and this of course also means that soon power will be possible. Of Nigeria's more than 80 million people, we know of course that over 20 million households have no power. But as part of efforts to diversify power sources in order to improve access, we started a program of providing solar power with private sector support in 20,000 homes in rural villages. And that is then multiplied in the uh, first phase is 20,000. We started in a, in a village just outside Abuja called Wuna. Wuna is an agrarian community, it's not on the national grid, and there is no other power source. To charge their phones, uh, there is a small electronic a small generator and he runs a service. So if you want to charge your phone, you take it to the, to the shop once a day, you pay a small fee and it charges. 
Life in Wuna used to be shut down at about 7 p.m. until daylight. But working with a PPP model, as I've explained, and the government owned NDPHC, we partnered with Azuri Technology, a private solar company, to provide a domestic solar solution. Azuri provided that same end to end service in East Africa, a solar home system, including a building system. The solar equipment is so it costs under 2,000 pounds, and, and that includes the cost of power for a five dollar uh, for about uh, an eight hour day of power. Every home has one mounted on the roof, and for the first time in its existence, the village now has running water, solar power. The school also has power. The school hall now, of course, uh, turned to a community hall in the evenings, also has power. Each room has four points of light, and of course, children can stay up late at night to start. The women can process their minutes and grams at night. New jobs, of course, have been created. So that installers, maintenance uh, persons, and the management of uh, the payment system itself. As I said earlier today, only one guy has lost his, his business. Only one guy has lost his job in the That's the phone channel. Every household. But on a more international scale, we have facilitated private solar power supply to markets across Nigeria using new extra power lithium cells in some of the oil market, the Kano solar market in Lagos, in Ibarra, uh, the uh, Bragi market, the Seco market in Peru, and several other markets. All of these are private sector driven using solar power. And time and time again, we see these innovations. Of the solar innovations all over, not just in Nigeria, but all over Africa. And it's becoming clearer. Algeria, there are good examples in Algeria, Kenya, and all of that. And it's becoming quite evident that with innovation, with increasing innovation, especially around solar power, it becomes cheaper, actually, more affordable, and of course more accessible to the large numbers of people. Education perhaps poses the most profound challenge and the best opportunity for innovation. In our country today, uh, our median age is about 18. These things are over 100, young people, 100 million young people who are about 18 or under, and they need to get educated. And of course, in higher quality that we're delivering today, they also need regular training for the new opportunities being created by technology and innovation. So a new curriculum is my self and innovation challenge. And we're currently working with MIT, with Cisco, and a few other technology companies in developing a digitally compliant curriculum for primary and secondary education. The only way to do the massive numbers of young people is through technological innovation that can deliver not just the best curriculum, but also the best teachers to the highest number of people. And to the highest number of pupils and students. We experimented with reaching large numbers of persons with teaching aids and instructional materials in our NPAR program. The program has engaged 500,000 graduates, some as teachers, some as extension workers, and public volunteers. Each of the first 200,000 is equipped with a tablet which contains instructional materials. And every one of them has access to an open portal that has training materials and topics from entrepreneurship to code writing and program. All of these half a million beneficiaries are engaged online, trained, and paid everyone electronically. We're now set to adapt these games to an online teacher training and retraining program, training for the new jobs technology and innovation also, all of these, of course, can now be done electronically. And this is gaining momentum. The federal government, for example, for example is investing in expanding the work of training developers, data scientists, and artificial intelligence experts for quality jobs locally and internationally. This was partnered by Adela, a company co-founded by a Nigerian uh, young and a technological innovation fund from 
AMDB, BOI. And we recently announced a CBM Bankers Committee, 200 trillion naira fund. We will focus on funding some of these trading initiatives. It is very clear that there is so much that is being done. Of course, there is so much opportunity to do even much more. And I say for good or for ill, because any or either scenario is possible. Given the checkered history of African development, it's not always the case that we follow the glaringly obvious path to progress and development. If Africa fails, the global impact will be unimaginable. Especially because, of, but if, of course, if Africa succeeds, that impact will even be, even, uh, that, that impact will in itself be something that we will be talking about for generations to come. But I am completely confident, especially because the future belongs to the young, to the youth of today, that Africa will for certain succeed. And we're already beginning the science today. May I again congratulate uh, Mr. Pascal who's your visit here the other day. Unfortunately, uh, you cannot uh, rest just yet for two reasons. The first is that your experience and influence and wisdom is needed now more than ever. But if you are not persuaded by that, then the second reason is a scriptural. At 19, God gave Abraham a new mandate. God said to Abraham that he must now get ready to begin his work and do and paraphrase the scripture. So, you, in your case, sir, you are only 18. And you have 10 more happy, healthy years before you get to Abraham's age of 19. So, you have no excuse whatsoever. I pray that you will see many more years in peace and joy. As your days, so shall you expect, so shall you wisdom, and so shall you favor of God. Happy birthday, sir.